growing up in coastal forests of Maine and finally found how to integrate the two as an undergraduate graduate at Williams College where they studied cultural evolution in songs of savanna sparrows. That sounds fascinating. They have since made several migratory flights to work with fish in Trinidad, botany, and waterfowl migration in northern Michigan and mule deer in California, but returned to their na natal habitat in 2020 to begin their PhD at Tufts, studying the impact of forest management on the bird community of northern Maine. After their degree, they hope to continue working in New England bird populations in the nonprofit or conservation sector. Right. Thanks for coming, people. Uh, I'm I love this project. It feels like a good way. To, it's it's I feel supremely grateful to get to work on it for my PhD. Um, so the the thirty year bird project overall is kind of a glimpse back in time to a uh, study that the team of PIs who work on the current study conducted thirty years ago in the commercial forest of Northern Maine. And so what we're doing is returning to the same landscape using the same methods and trying to figure out how changes in forest management and forest structure have impacted the bird populations that are there. Um, and I've been really excited for how some of the upcoming results of our project, n not all of which I'll be presenting today because we don't have them all yet, um, but how these dovetail really nicely with I think the, the, some of the rest of the research that folks in this room have been presenting on today that I've gotten the privilege to watch. Um, so it's just kind of like a little overview of the talk. I'm um, gonna be giving some of the scientific and historical context for why we think this landscape in particular is important from a broader conservation perspective and why, as you all know, it's important to, to study birds in multiple different habitats. Um, and then I'll detail sort of our particular research approaches and what we've found so far in our research. Um, so I need not uh, spend too much time on the three billion birds loss decline, um, as a lot of us are very familiar with it. Um, but I think this in particular has been something that's been bouncing around scientific and public circles, but is also uh, increasingly well known within circles of folks who do forest management um, or who work on a more commercial basis. Um, so part of our motivations for going into the Northwoods and studying bird populations there are that a number of the groups identified by this report as in steep decline across their continental ranges have significant um, areas of potential habitat in commercial forests like the Northwoods. So we want to know more about what those, how those populations are doing on managed landscapes. Um, and so part of the reason we know so much about bird declines now is we have a wealth of ci largely citizen gathered um, bird data. So I'm sure a lot of you have participated in either uh, breeding bird surveys or use of eBird or maybe both. Um, together these provide us with just kind of an unimaginable, uh, what would have been an unimaginable amount of data 50 years ago um, on the distributions of spe species throughout their breeding ranges and throughout other times of the year. Um, so we can ask a lot of questions at broader scales that we might not have been able to in the past. Um, but one of the challenges with using data sources like this is they're not uniform in time and space because they depend on where people can regularly go birding. So in the breeding season, which in the nor Northern Hemisphere is the summertime, most bird data that we have, the more continuous and consistent forms of bird data from sources like eBird and the Breeding Bird Survey are from areas where people live or where people visit really frequently like a national park or a preserve land. Um, but this means that there are vast areas of parts of North America, including the main Northwoods, which you can see in a map of Maine at night is this giant, dark Black spot so. in, in the northwest corner of the state where people spend a lot less time and so consequently, consequently we have just way less information on what bird populations are doing up there. So that's a, another major, major motivation for our study is getting out into that landscape and trying to start to fill that information gap so we can be sure what birds are using habitats in that landscape and, and understand more about its conservation value at a broader scale. And another reason that it's hard to <laughs> get consistent data in these landscapes <laughs> is if you set out into the Northwoods or a similar landscape, you might not get very far as we <laughs> found out. This was one of several stuck trucks um, of field crews of mine this season because it's, it's boggy, wild, relatively undeveloped country up there. I mean, actually, I think I, I should say beforehand, just to give you kind of a sense of the scale of this landscape, we're talking about 
10 million acres of entirely undeveloped forest land. So the only thing up there is dirt logging roads, a couple little way stations where you might have a trailer or two, but no permanent residents, no paved roads, and basically no permanent infrastructure. So it's a massive landscape, and our, the portion of which we study is about a million acres, so maybe a, t a tenth of the total size. Um, but in any case, it's, it's hard to get consistent bird data up there because it's just hard to get up there. That said, from the data we do have, we know that this landscape is of broad conservation importance on a uh, continental scale in that the National Audubon Society has recognized the main Northwoods and adjoining portions of the Maine and New Hampshire mountains as the largest single contiguous important bird area in the lower 48 states for the breeding habitat that it provides to a number of threatened species from that third three billion birds report, which might be neotropical migrants or resident species or both. Um, so we see a great urgency in studying birds on this landscape in particular. Um, so I'll delve into some of what I think are kind of the important way stations along the way of the human history of this landscape as um, different human interactions with the landscape dovetail with how habitat has changed over time. So if we start all the way back at the beginning, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you do in your mind's eye, and I do often as well, um, where we're standing today, a mere 10 or 12,000 years ago would have a mile of ice above our heads and no forest bird habitat within hundreds of miles in any direction. And so only maybe eight or 9,000 years ago for the north woods of Maine are we talking about any type of conditions where a forest could start to grow. So the forests that exist here and the bird communities as we understand them are really young in geologic time. <laughs> but the flip side of that is that we're fairly confident that the early formation of this forest pretty closely coincides with when the first First Nations peoples were arriving from further west in North America. So the forests of northern Maine and New England in general are some of the oldest on earth that have been continuously inhabited by people for their entire existence in their current form. So in other words, people have always been participants in and shapers of the ecology of the forest that we work in. And this is important from a broader perspective in that disturbance in its many forms has always been an integral part of the ecology of this landscape too, as we talk, just, just saw in Dave's talk in the main auditorium. Um, so there's a number of different types we can talk about. Um, human disturbance, as we understand it, was less intense than in areas like around here or maybe Cape Cod, um, where there was more clearing for game land with fire. Um, but among the tribes we know about, um, which most recently were Narantzawak, uh, Wolastakiak, Abenaki, and Penobscot in the region that we work with, um, we can reasonably expect some small-scale clearing or harvesting on various scales in areas where people spent more time in, in the landscape. And this, this would have been combined with a whole suite of natural disturbances that occurred as well. So winter storms are maybe slightly less intense as we hear from the foresters who still work out there. Um, they're still pretty bitter in northern Maine, but they were wild hundreds or thousands of years ago. And a, a single ice storm or a single heavy snowstorm can topple a significant amount of the canopy of a forest, particularly if you have like more vulnerable species to damage from, from wind and snow. So come breeding season, you'd have a lot of openness and you'd, you'd start to, you'd create conditions where a younger forest could come up and grow. Um, periodic fire is less frequent and less widespread than in areas further west and north, like the kind of boreal shield of central Canada, where it's a little bit drier and fire is a more present disturbance force on the landscape. But we know from surveyors, um, who were looking on future commercial forest land in northern Maine in the 1700s, that large burned areas were encounterable and common enough that they would have been an important source of clearing of understory and in severe cases, creation of early successional habitat. And then animals themselves also have the capacity to influence their habitat. So spruce budworm is a really important, uh, significant native insect species that goes through these 40 to 70 year fluctuations in abundance. And in severe cases, the larvae of spruce budworms can completely defoliate and kill the canopy of a mature or older forest stand, which as you can imagine, over time will open up the understory and allow, uh, once again, uh, allow another condition for early successional forest to grow. And one of my favorites is that actually 
birds themselves even acted as disturbance agents. So an, an amazing example I learned about last spring at a forestry conference um, is that passenger pigeon nesting aggregations in their heyday could be 100 acres or more in size. And if really dense, the weight of the nests of passenger pigeons could, in serious cases, topple an entire mature tree or an entire stand of trees on a, on a small local scale. And if you have a, a big group of pigeons in one place for a month, you'll also get a nice deposit of at least a foot of manure on the ground underneath. <laughs> so moving, and once the flock moves on, once again, you can imagine just a, that is a really intense positive and, and negative point scale disturbance on the landscape that would move through space and time as passenger pigeon flocks did. And so all of these disturbance types exist together to mostly operating on relatively small and relatively infrequent scales to create kind of what we call a shifting mosaic. That's a, a John Hagen, one of the PIs, that's his, uh, he might have coined that term. He uses it a lot to describe kind of the dynamic change of habitat through time within what would have been primarily older growth forest on this landscape, thousands to hundreds of years ago. And all of this continues relatively stably up until a big inflection point right around European colonization. Um, which changed a lot about the frequency and scope of disturbance on the landscape. Um, so obviously, um, through your Euro European colonization, we have the um, results in the death and displacement of thousands of indigenous people through violence and disease. And so necessarily, you're also losing some of their um, longstanding cultural interactions with the landscape and, and uh, influences on its structure. And as well, uh, suppression of spruce budworm and fire have been varying parts of the forest management regime in Maine over the past several hundred years as well. So those, the types of the frequency and scale of disturbance that they would cause has changed also. And sadly, passenger pigeons are gone too. Um, but this, I think this inflection point, the most, one of the most consequential things it marks from a habitat perspective is the first time where human-derived disturbance was likely ascended to be the primary force of disturbance on the landscape. Um, and so part of what we're doing on this project is to continue to sort of pick apart the implications for that shift for bird habitat and for forest structure in general. And so part of th this story, um, there, there's a sharp inflection point, but the occurrences or the changes thereafter, I think would be better characterized as kind of a gradual evolution of human impact on the landscape through space and time. So early on, more accessible and flat and fertile areas of southern and central Maine, like where I grew up, were largely cleared for agriculture, while parts of the Northwoods where we were today would have remained mostly closed canopy forest as before. Um, what disturbance was occurring there was largely selective logging, so first for the biggest, tallest white pines to provide ship masts. Um, we, we know some about, uh, have some accounts of that going on or that having recently happened from some of the rose writings um, paddling along the west branch of the Penobscot, um, where we spent a lot of time the past few summers um, from the mid-1800s. And then a shift from white pine to spruce and fir logs with ships in the solid log market around the turn of the Civil War. And all of this, uh, the gradual, human, uh, gradual increase of human impact would occur in little kind of chunks and pieces in more accessible stands around the edges of the Northwoods, um, though without large clearings in that landscape for the most part, up until um, kind of <coughs> abutting into the 1900s with uh, more of the ascendancy of commercial forestry. And all of this occurs as kind of a slow, gradual increase in human impact up until another really significant inflection point which was the ban in 1973 of log drives in Maine as a forest practice. So that, as many of you probably know, was the primary method before mechanized days for loggers to put the logs that they had harvested out on a frozen lake or river and then let gravity do the work for them of bringing them down to the mill in the springtime with the meltwater. Um, but with this practice banned in the mid-1970s, foresters leading up to the ban and then afterwards recognized that they had to develop a completely different strategy for getting their wood out of, out of the woods. And the main method they used to do so was to build a whole bunch of logging dams. And so 
th these are both pictures of the Golden Road, where we also spend a lot of time. That's probably the most famous of all of Maine's uh, logging roads, one of those fabled ones that Maine school kids sort of hear about if they don't live in the region. Um, but this is sort of the Maine spoke of a, an entire network of logging roads that bloomed onto the most remote portions of the Maine Northwoods during that time. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I just want to make sure I understood. So the, the, the process that was banned was using waterways to bring the logs Exactly, back? yeah. And the major concern there was uh, bank erosion and water quality. Thank you. Um, as well as, I'm... How about death of the loggers? That was, that was the other My thing I was going to say, was, was general water safety. In the early 1900s, and he would watch these people jump from log to log and sort of pick them and try to steer the logs down. They'd be on the water, icy right. water. Yeah. Uh, logging is currently, I think, the second most dangerous occupation in the United States after f commercial fishing, mm -hmm. and it was probably the most dangerous at, in that period, for mostly for that reason. I can't imagine jumping from log to log with spikes <laughs> on <laughs> in icy waters. In, in, so really, really tough, wild people did that work. Um, so obviously, you know, we have a, a big increase in safety and also a big increase in the efficiency of bringing logs out of the woods. And part of this shift also occurred in tandem with the rise of what we call vertically integrated mill companies. So essentially, a single company owns the mill, but also owns the logging trucks, the logging equipment, the logging roads, and the contracts of anybody operating anywhere in that chain. So they can essentially function as like a giant organism for harvesting wood really efficiently and predictably from the landscape. So if we had been doing this study 50 or 70 years ago, kind of right, right around or before the creation of the Golden Road and creation of earlier logging roads before then, we might have encountered a more, what I expect to be a more predictable turnover in forest habitat on the landscape from mid-age mature to early successional and back again. Um, and this all leads up to the <laughs> most consequential recent inflection point in the history here which was a seismic change in land ownership in northern Maine in the mid-1900s, when a majority of land changed hands, often multiple times, in the span of 10 years. And where your primary landowners before the mid-90s would have been um, either vertically integrated mill companies or small, smaller family-owned logging companies, where their priorities might be either to maintain like a reliable reservoir of wood for the paper mill or grow high quality saw logs that they could send to a, a more lucrative market, um, which in both cases will grow older forests. A lot of the new landowners um, were these different types of short-term investment holders who were short-term investors who were looking to largely liquidate as much of the forest assets as they could in a very short period of time and then sell really quickly. So forest practices changed a ton during this period, and there was a lot more pressure for harvesting on shorter rotations and just harvesting more to take as much wood out of the landscape as you possibly could. Um, and this also, unsurprisingly, coincides with a moment of really intense political pressure in Maine um, to ban clear cuts, uh, largely driven by the Maine public. And this is inspired in part by these kind of really visceral marquee clear cuts, like what, we, what was dubbed the Great Ragmuff Clear Cut, which was 15,000 acres of spruce budworm salvage operation. Um, and we, we have a lot of points from both studies on this landscape. So Hagen et al. in, 19, in the 1990s, who are the original PIs and now the, the PIs on this new project, um, recognized at the time that both foresters and the public were going to need really concrete and reliable data about how wildlife populations, specifically bird populations, were using each of the forest types on this landscape so they could begin to understand the implications for when there's a really significant change in how forests are managed, can we understand and can s somebody predict how birds will respond to changes like that? Um, so largely what we're doing with the current project is asking similar questions with the current state of forest practices on the landscape, but also being able to ask how change over time has, has influenced bird populations. Um, so some of the changes that we can already talk about are for one, clear cuts this size have been banned. So there's there's a new limit on clear cut size. I mean, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's not 15,000 acres. Um, and so necessarily all of the clearings from that era have grown back into forest. And it's actually kind of astonishing to be on the landscape where just a couple of years before I was born, 
it would have felt like Montana, just an open field as far as you could see. And now when you walk around in the same Great Ragmuff clear cut, you're walking through 40 or 50 foot tall, 30 year old spruce fir forest. And you might not even know that it had been cleared if you, if you didn't know any better. Were they planting the, the forest after the not clear cut? Largely not. M for, to some extent there was, areas had some intense herbiciding to prevent hardwood regrowth, like occurs in northern New Hampshire, as we heard about earlier today. Um, for the most part, planting is really resource and money and time intensive and labor intensive, and just how far out this is, it would be a massive undertaking. So they don't have to replant, there's no rule. Now, most of this is, with the herbicide knocking down young hardwood trees, most of this is just natural regrowth. And you know, the, the tallest trees in this stand today are gonna to be these little guys that were, were left behind and had lots of space to, to grow up. So of all, of all the places to harvest wood from, Maine is a relatively, the, the biome of Maine and Northern New England in general is a relatively resilient forest to disturbance because it evolved with numerous different types of disturbance. What we've done is basically just change the scale and frequency on which that disturbance happens. So that's, I think, kind of the major source of concern from an ecological perspective, or at least curiosity is, does how often and how intensively we manage forests, has that changed anything about the structure of forests that we create and the ways that wildlife can use those habitats? Um, but at least one piece of good news is that if you leave a, a clear cut alone for long enough, it will come back to forest as long as the conditions are amenable. So something else that's changed in <coughs> terms of forest practices is foresters are still looking to harvest the same amount of wood as before, but because they now can't use giant clear cuts to do so, they have to use alternative methods. And shelter wood and strip cuts are two of the methods that have really kind of come to ascendancy since the 1990s, starting just kind of in anticipation of the ban. Um, but what's significant about this from a habitat perspective is you can see all of these kind of little parallel herringbone lines, which is what a strip cut looks like from above. Um, with kind of residual patches of left trees and then, then skid roads where you'd cut. And so this might mean on a really small scale, less intense disturbance than a clear cut, say, but in order to harvest the same amount of wood as before, you have to increase the total area of forest that you're harvesting over. So if we look at the plot here of main harvested acres by method, total harvest area increases essentially in step with the increase in strip cutting because foresters had to basically double the amount of forest that they were harvesting from in any given year. So that begs the question, uh, how has the increase in overall area disturbed maybe crossed with the lesser intensity of disturbance in any one place influenced what the habitat structure looks like and how birds can use that habitat? And so that's kind of our, one of our major questions from a management perspective that we hope will guide management recommendations for each project. Um, so I'm gonna walk quickly through um, some of our methods. I think some of these will be familiar from, from previous talks today, um, so we won't spend as much time on them. Uh, but essentially, we're asking the two same questions as the original study, where we wanna know which habitat types are available, in what proportions, in what relative amounts, and how are they oriented around the landscape, and which birds are using each one. Um, and then because we have replicated data using the same methods as 30 years ago, we can also ask how those have changed our lives. And then eventually once we've completed our analyses and um, have a better understanding of how habitat structure is influencing birds, we're hoping to work with our partners in the forest products industry and the conservation sector in the region to make recommendations that can help them meet their goals for harvest or conservation or some combination of the two and help create bird ha or maintain bird habitat at the same time. So the first thing we have to do is figure out where we're going. And the main tool that we get to use to do that is uh, stand maps that all of the companies we work with were gracious to give us access to. And these tell you a whole bunch of detail about the minute fine scale structure of a stand at any given point. Um, but essentially the codes are telling you about the hardwood softwood composition, the age, and then the canopy closure or you know, degree of space between the, the canopy layer of a forest, all of which are likely to be important for the bird community that lives there. But 
this is way more finer scale data than we could ever get a represent representative sample size for each one for. So what we did um, was follow the same methods as the original study and kind of clump really fine scale designations of habitat into broader categories. And so we've got these nine here orient, uh, organized roughly by age, where clear cuts are our youngest, recently cut down. Um, regenerating clear cuts we class as maybe 10 to 15 year old forest. Um, I think the height cutoff was six to 12 meters. Um, so really dense young forests. And then residual regen looks like a regenerating forest, but it has some residual old trees from a previous harvest that were left behind from a previous harvest operation. And then among our more homogeneous forests, we've got um, mid-aged and late successional forest and then hardwood and softwood dominated and then mixed stands in each of those. So our main goal was to get a representative sample of each of these nine habitat types so we could know what was going on with the bird community there. And so these are the, the points from the original 1990s study covering, again, rough, roughly a one million acre circle around uh, Moosehead Lake. Um, and then these are the points from the 2020s. Um, increased the sample size by a little bit, which is great. We had a great crew. Um, and the first thing you'll probably notice is that they're not in exactly the same places. And this was intentional simply for the fact that because forests have grown up or been cut down in the meantime, if we wanted to sample the same proportions of each habitat type, we had to look in slightly different places to find those same forests. But we had the overall goal of staying within the same relative region so that we weren't running into any geographic differences in the, in the bird community that we wanted to map. <coughs> and so our, our bread and bu butter method for collecting bird data is point counts. Um, we've heard a lot about these today. I'm sure, I'm sure many of you have, have <laughs> done many of them over time. Um, I think the, the key pieces for ours are just that we're, uh, well, out of interest, we, I had the impression that most birds were detected by ear and we ran the numbers this year and I think it was 95% of our detections were heard only. And that's largely to do with, the, I mean, this is a, a relatively open forest compared to some of the ones we were in. So, you know, in a given stand where you're wading through young spruce fir, you're probably not gonna see many birds even if you wait for a long time. Um, and the other important piece is that we're keeping track of in and out birds um, within a set radius around a point, which is what lets us calculate density on them that lengthen their habitat. And we had a phenomenal crew who were getting up with us you know, every day at 2.30 or 3.15 and then spending the day dodging bear attacks, which I <laughs> wasn't happy about. Um, <laughs> they, were, they were all fine. We, we followed the safety protocols, but it's, there's, there's lots of wildlife out there. Um, speeding logging trucks, sinkholes, uh, so they, they did really good work um, despite the, the challenges of working up there. And they were in luck because after a relaxing season of point counts, uh, we followed right up with a relaxing season of in intensive vegetation surveys at every point. Um, and there's a whole bunch of data that we collect on these, but the, the basic takeaway is that we want to understand um, something about the structure and composition of the canopy layer, the understory shrub layer, and the herb layer as we suspected that these would be um, kind of like dimensions of the habitat or features of the habitat that are likely to be important for how birds orient themselves in space and how they pick a habitat to, to settle down at for breeding season. So now that we've collected all of these data over the past two seasons, um, I'll share some of uh, what we've found so far with the major caveat that we've got a ton of data <laughs> and so we haven't, we haven't sifted through all of it yet. Um, I think the, the vegetation data was something around 21,000 rows of veg records. So it's gonna take a little while to pour through it. Um, so take any conclusions here with the grain of salt that they may change slightly by the time we get to publication or in future presentations. Um, but I think the, the heart of them uh, should remain consistent. So first of all, from a habitat perspective, um, one of the things upcoming that we couldn't quite get done before this presentation, but that's kind of our first priority is calculating exactly the relative amount of each of our nine habitat classes on the landscape. So we can say kind of quantitatively, how has the amount of those habitats changed over time? At least from a qualitative perspective, having s spent time looking for each of these habitats and trying to get a representative sample size, there's a ton of mid-age forest up here, as was consistent with, with Dave's talk earlier. Um, 
And if there's any habitat type that was more difficult to find, it's old, late successional softwood forests. These big, open, understory spruce fir forests are see are either in were mostly in preserved lands or in small isolated pockets that were rough, difficult to access on like steep mountain slopes or really isolated parts of this habitat. So for the most part, that habitat that those trees are pretty valuable from a silvicultural perspective. So it's not surprising that there's not much of that habitat in the room, um, but that's maybe one to keep an eye out for um, on the sixth year bird study or in, in future studies in the region. Um, but in general, all nine of the original class habitat classes exist at least enough that we could sample the bird community here. So they're all still there. Um, within our bird community, we had 102 species on the surveys, and I'd say there's maybe 20 or 30 more species within the landscape that are relatively common, but are either really wide ranging, and so we don't run into them on point counts, um, or we're unlikely to, or they use mainly non-forested habitat. And then within those 102, we had 77 within our 50 meter radius around the point center. And so these are gonna be the core of our analysis because um, we have density measures for them, and so we can relate them to habitat variables. Um, so I'm gonna share some kind of species specific windows into what bird habitat relationships look like on this landscape um, to kind of illustrate different ways that they can use habitat. And our plan is for each species that we have a sufficient sample size of to kind of tell the, the same story um, to, to get a sense of what, what the overall picture looks like. So fortunately, some, some of the species are relatively predictable. So white-throated sparrows, which I'm sure those of you who've spent time with them in the breeding season or in the wintering season know them <coughs> from shrubby areas, dense brush, they like good cover. And so we expected to find them in the earliest successional habitat, their clear cuts or young regenerating forest. And this is largely where we found them, but much consistently higher densities in the, the three earliest habitats, which are our, again, our clear cut um, regen and residual regen, and then significantly lower densities in the mid-age and late successional forests. <coughs> So white-throated sparrows did what we expected. And it's, it's nice, at least for your ego as a scientist, when your study species does what you're expecting. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we expected to find black burning warblers in the oldest, mature, really open understory softwood forest. Beautiful place to spend time in the summer. A nice, refreshing change after bouncing through a, a fir thicket. Um, and so you know, any of you who've spent time birding in Maine in the summertime, this is probably the type of habitat where and once again, this is a habitat mainly where we ran into blackbird and warblers was late successional mixed and late successional softwood forest with lower densities in the remaining habitats. But where a less than 50% subset of the species did mostly what we were expecting, a majority of species did some unexpected things. So golden crown kinglets are another species that from field guides and general experience I would have and you know, kind of expert testimony, other papers I've read, I would have expected to find in really similar habitats to black burning warblers, your late successional mixed wood and late successional softwood stands. And while we did find them in these habitats, we found essentially comparable densities in mid successional mixed wood and softwood stands on this landscape, which is an, from the perspective of a human observer walking through those forests, feels completely different. You can maybe move in one case 100 meters in 20 minutes in one of those stands, basically swimming over the tops of young trees, whereas you could walk, you could probably jog a mile in 20 minutes in a late successional softwood stand. So it's really surprising to see a single species using what seemed to us like very structurally different habitats in the same densities. And to add to that, golden crown kinglets were also present in every other habitat type, the lower densities as well. And another species following a similar pattern Hermit thrush is another one that I would have expected mostly in old forests. And while we did find them there, they actually had higher densities in mid-age forests and in some of the younger forest classes, even down to 10 or 15 year old regenerating forests, and were essentially ubiquitous throughout. And I think what this highlights isn't necessarily that field guides or other studies are wrong about hermit thrushes. I think more importantly, what it's highlighting is that species each species is likely to perceive a different set of features within a habitat that might not be tied to a single habitat within the total range of habitats that they occupy. And the features that they perceive and select for 
might not be the same species, uh, the same features that we perceive as human observers when we walk in there, because birds perceive the world completely differently than we do. They probably smell things that we can't. They see in the ultraviolet in ways that we can't. And um, you know, behaviorally, they they interact with habitat in different ways. Um, so I think when unexpected things like this happen, this is one of the most exciting things for me as a scientist. Um, and, and makes me want to kind of like dig deeper and, and, and cover what, what the mystery is underneath. And to kind of thicken the plot a little bit more, um, recent work from the past two years in New Brunswick and down East Maine um, from some folks we know in, in both of these cases found much stronger associations as expected with late successional forest for both of these species than earlier successional forests. And this is really surprising given the broader context that in terms of climate, forest biome, and general biotic community, northern Maine and New Brunswick and down east Maine are, sh we would expect, expect to be very similar. Not a lot of variation, at least in terms of external conditions there. So we should, ex we would reasonably expect them to be doing the same things in those habitats. And so we don't really, we don't know yet what's driving this difference. Our leading suspicion is differences in forest management. In particular, because the scientists in New Brunswick have highlighted that plantation silviculture is way more common in the really intensively managed forests of <coughs> um, interior New Brunswick. And a, plan a rigid, um, widely spaced plantation of mid aged softwood forest is structurally very different from a naturally regenerating softwood forest. So, our, our suspicion is that something about the overall broad scale structure of New Brunswick forests or down east forests um, is not providing the same habitat within younger forest classes that the naturally regenerating habitat in the Northwoods might be providing. But that's a story that our detailed vegetation data will give us uh, more legs to stand on. So, so for now, it's mainly speculation. Yeah, to your, your point that these two studies are showing that those forest birds are more specialized than they study birds? Yeah, right. So they're, they were much lower density in mid-age and early successional forests in these, in these studies, in much higher density. Similar, they essentially would have looked like the, like this plot mm -hmm. for golden crown killer for her exposure. Whereas on our legs, they would look like this, much more evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking that something is different about what a late successional soft or what a mid successional softwood stand looks like, what we call mid softwood, and what s someone in New Brunswick or someone in Down East Maine calls mid softwood might be structurally different enough that they're good for golden crown kinglets in the Northwoods and maybe not as good in Maine. But that's part of what the, the vegetation data will tell. You said that that Down East Maine and Northwoods have enough similarities that you thought it would be the same. Yeah. And I. I I'm asking about that because I think when I go to the North Woods, the bugs are many more yeah. than there are <laughs> on the coast. Um, the weather is different. Right. I think. Now, I don't, I'm not a I'm scientific yeah, no, observer, you but are just right. personally. Um, I love the, the food aspect of the question is sort of like one of the big black box mysteries here mm -hmm. that we don't have we don't have data on. And in general, like I think in ways that Bird, in places bird data are spotty, insect data are even spottier. Mm -hmm. So kind of the, this, this is, I'll foreshadow a little bit for, for the end of the talk where I'll talk about kind of future work we're doing. I'm really curious about spruce budworm in particular mm -hmm. as at least an insect that we have a lot of data on that you can measure that we know is really important to birds when it's there. So you can ask questions about food sort of as like a natural experiment if you look at spruce budworm and the birds that are using it. And then you could extrapolate from that to think about like, okay, if we're having changes in the food, in the sort of regular food supply of insects that don't go through those wild swings in abundance, how might that influence how birds are selecting habitat? So I think you're right to, well, to you call it to that. I, I, I learned today that what the birds are eating in the spring are the, are the caterpillars. Right. But what I was thinking of is the black flies, there which are, just aren't on the coast. Yeah. Like they are. Not in the same way. Yeah. No. <laughs> Having but grown up on the coast, they're not there. Eat you know, in the air, they're eating. These, these guys in person, well, hermit thrushes would mainly be foraging on the ground and kinglets would, are mainly gleaning off of the foliage. Um, but again, I, I, you know, okay. kinglets are eating spiders, tiny little arthropods, um, but we, we just don't know that much about their diet.
but that, that's that's one of those big kind of mystery pieces that that's a qualifier for the type of work we do. Um, where are we going next? Oh, so I, I, one of the the broader pieces that sort of fits ties most closely to the theme of this this seminar today um, is the state of the birds within the Northwoods. And again, our exact kind of estimates of overall population size and change in overall population size within the area we, area we study are gonna depend on the exact amounts of habitat, which we have yet to calculate. So these plots right here are just showing density. So I'll, I'll start lead with the caveat that these aren't necessarily a representation of the state of the overall population. They are at least caused to look closer for species where we see declining or at least consistent densities across all habitats um, over the past 30 years. So our, our gray bars here are 1990s <coughs> average densities per habitat, and then the purple bars are 2023 trees, and then dark purple is an anticipated little plot. Uh, so both of, both of these species are of a set of maybe five that had um, noticeably lower densities across a lot of habitats. That's five right. Okay, cool. Um, a greater number of species within the total assemblage had surprisingly higher densities in most habitats than they had 30 years ago. Um, and I'll leave that where it is for now. We can talk about it um, during the question period after. Again, for the moment, we're largely speculating about what might be driving these um, before we get to the vegetation structure data, which might be able to tell us more about how these particular habitats have changed over time and whether they've opened up space that might be more usable for, for particular species. And then I also wanted to show this really interesting potential story emerging here with black-throated blue warblers and some other species that are potentially shifting the habitats they're using, um, where we see lower or consistent densities in our mid-age forest, but increasing densities in younger and older forests for black-throated blue warblers over the past 30 years. So this, this one's particularly interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll leave off on it for now, but we can, we can come back to this one. Um, I think, well actually I, I, I will, I'll, I'll go into what I was going to, which is that um, I think one possible reason uh, that we'll be looking more closely into that could explain a change like this is if a species is selecting for a particular feature of the landscape or a particular feature of a habitat that isn't necessarily tied to a particular habitat over time. So say black-throated blue warblers were really strongly linked with the total amount of hobble bush in the understory. If 30 years ago, mid-age forest had the most hobble bush in the understory, it would be reasonable to expect that's where we'd find black-throated blue warblers, if that's the feature that we're tying them to. But if through forest management or some other process, hobble bush became more common in late successional or earlier forest, it might be reasonable to expect that black-throated blue warblers would track that habitat feature irrespective of the habitats that they were moving into. So this is another case where, you know, we've imposed these different designations of habitat based on how we kind of categorize it into reasonable categories, but those aren't necessarily the categories that a bird is organizing in its own mind or, or however it perceives the habitat. But the flip side of that question is maybe maybe the species is selecting a different feature of the habitat or has changed how it's using the habitat within the range of possible plasticity. Um, so getting at that duality is gonna be one of the things that I'm most excited about to come from the vegetation data. I think one other thing this highlights is that um, even for the species that we would call maybe the most stereotypical habitat specialist within this landscape, we can see that they're using all other habitats, that, albeit lower densities, but still present in, in almost every other habitat in the landscape. And I think what this highlights is that all habitat is potentially valuable or at least usable by most species within the assemblage. And in general, I think um, peripheral habitat for kind of broad scale, from a broad scale conservation perspective has maybe been underappreciated um, in, in some previous studies. Um, in particular, I think because if uh, say there's way, uh, you have a landscape with a huge proportion of mid-age forest and maybe a small proportion of younger forest, you might still expect a relatively healthy population of white-throated sparrows on that landscape, just dispersed at low densities and then with high density pockets here. Um, but some studies I've read really only focus on the primary habitat and I think you're missing a piece of the puzzle 
if, or you risk missing a piece of the puzzle and you risk maybe skewing your, your overall abundance estimates if you do so. Um, brief story we can, we can delve into a little bit more. Um, potential change in the overall community structure um, in that we detected 12 new species since the 1990s and failed to detect three that were on the landscape before. Um, part of this story is probably explained by the fact that some of these, you know, green herons are not really a forest bird. We happened to just put a point count station unknowingly beneath a green heron nest, and so we got some on the point count. So some of these species are likely just sparse, and so maybe just weren't detected by random chance. Is that and a then, prairie warbler? Hmm? Is that a prairie warbler? It's a pine it's warbler. Pine pine. Yeah. So yeah, I'll actually, I'll skip to these guys because this, these are, I think, the most interesting to me are cardinals, indigo bunting, bluebird, pine warbler, classic feeder birds with primary distributions further south in North America. I suspect these represent kind of the first vanguard of climate change in our region. And incidentally, we also had the first area of mockingbird and the first county Carolina wren on the project, just out <laughs> on the point. So they're coming. Uh, and we, we can return to, to these guys during the question period if people are curious. What, what, uh, what species on that one? Three toed woodpecker. Oh, thank so you. They had, I, I think part of the story is that all three of these were relatively low density, like maybe two or three points in the 1990s, maybe. What's the last one again? This, uh, Philadelphia deer. Okay. Downward brush. Downward brush yeah. um, so the final piece I wanted to get to here is sort of like bringing our research into the context of broader bird conservation in the region. And so this, this is a representation of um, trends in breeding bird survey data since the 1960s um, for most of the, the subset of species we're looking at. And there's, there's no way to pick out an individual species here. So the main <laughs> takeaway I wanted to, to take from this plot is like the, the trend within a state or within a small region doesn't necessarily correspond with the trend at a regional or national scale. And so I think part of what this highlights is doing studies of birds and habitat in multiple different areas and synthesizing them together is a really important way for gathering more detailed and reliable information about the total population health, well-being, however you want to put it, for particular species. And I think this is where relatively undersurveyed areas like the Northwoods come in as an area where we, we really need to gather more data um, so that our full-scale regional estimates of population sizes are as robust and reliable as they can be. Because um, the birds are counting on us. Uh, and like I think... Good association, right? hmm? really? yeah. It's like a pretty good association, right? For the most part, yeah. yeah. There's a couple... That's always yeah. a fail, Eric. For the most part, it's consistent. But there's, yeah. you know, who's this? <laughs> we could spend hours looking at Yeah, up. Nashville warblers way more strongly declining at a regional level than in Maine. Uh -huh. So it's, this is a place where you can, you know, you might pick through and, and pick yeah, your five favorite species part. and try and I figure out which one you bird. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, actually, that what that highlights for us is I think the, the species we're going to be looking most closely at from a conservation perspective are ones that are strongly increasing or strongly decreasing in the Northwoods, and then to compare those to the trends at broader scales to see whether the Northwoods is succeeding in providing habitat that they don't have elsewhere or if it's not providing habitat that they need. And that's ultimately what's gonna guide our management recommendations to our, our partners in the project. Um, and I think one, one thing I'm ex excited about is at least from our, our conversations with conservationists and foresters in the region, they all know about bird declines and are, at least the ones that we're working with, are actively interested in incorporating recommendations from our project into how they manage for habitat that they already are good at managing and how they maybe improve habitat that they don't already manage as well. So, do you have a question, Chris? We can just sort oh, of move uh, smoothly uh, into sorry. questions at this point because this is basically. Um, oh, how was I going to get to this? <laughs> es es essentially, uh, the same the same two pieces I've already talked about. Um, we need to get to next, which is this landscape level abundances and habitat structure, vegetation data stuff. Um, I'm really curious about the intersection between interspecies interactions and food, which is part of the, the spruce budworm system that I'm hoping to be looking at um, in the next two field seasons, if I can figure out the, the funding and the logistics, um, and then obviously make our, our management recommendation. And I did want to make a brief plug for the main Northwoods uh, virtual accessible birding trail, um, which we're setting up in partnership with the Appalachian Mountain Club 
on their holdings close to Greenville and the Moosehead Lake region um, this coming summer while doing some field work. Um, so essentially this will be a drivable curated tour of each of the habitat types within our project where they're present on the AMC holdings up there um, with kind of audio and informational components that people can download beforehand and take out with them in the fields because there's no cell service <laughs> or Wi-Fi out there. Um, and then uh, permanent signage kind of along the road at each of the places. So you can go at any time of the year, you can take your snowmobile out in the winter and stop by one of the habitat parcels, pop in your earphones and listen to what the habitat would, would sound like in the summertime. Um, so we're, we're really excited in particular to, to work with AMC because um, they've been really eager to incorporate our results into how they're managing that whole parcel. And I think this, this community engagement piece is really exciting. So if any of you are, are interested in, in getting involved and in, in coming, coming to see what it's like, we'll be setting this up through June and July this year, and then hopefully the pilot version will be ready by August. And we love visitors, because it gets lonely up there. So, so come on down. Where, where do you stay? Uh, we, well, we had the good fortune of staying at a, a lake house on Moosehead Lake last year, which I had nothing to do with. That was all uh, Kelsey Anderson, my co-lead on the project, who's a grad student at UNH. Um, who's one of the most like dedicated and organized people I've ever met. So it's she like I would not have been able to do any of this work without uh, co-working with Kelsey. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to generally thank our field team, all our funding sources, um, partners at Fish and Wildlife, and the land ownerships we've worked with, who've given us a ton of access to information and actually let us do this project. And then personal thanks from me for the the PI team, because it's been really helpful from a personal development perspective to see all of the different ways they've migrated outwards from the original bird study and then come back together with, with different areas of expertise. So, you probably said it, but what is, what is the PI team? Oh, that's the sort of lead, lead researchers on the, on the project, principal investigator. 